Thank you for that um, wonderful <laughs> welcome. And I would like to just thank everybody. This has been truly a wonderful two days that I've spent here. Um, I've visited classes. I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed the conversations with students and with faculty. And um, this is an absolutely beautiful campus. I visited one of the schools today. And this has just been a terrific two, um, two days. So thank you so much, and particularly to the students for organizing this event. Um, when, when I was asked to talk about the, the topic here, I thought about something that has been um, very interesting to me, and that is the process of how somebody learns to become a culturally competent teacher. And I thought about that through several vantage points. I'm periodically asked to reflect on, you know, like, what's your story? I grew up in a predominantly white area of Southern Oregon. And how did you learn to become, uh, learning to become cultural competent? It's, it's something that you're always learning. It's like you're never there. But what's your story? Um, as a teacher educator, I've, um, by observing teacher education students and teachers, been trying to figure out what are the most powerful ways that we can help teachers grow. And I've done this through research, through developing portraits of classroom teachers, and most recently now through writing a novel that tries to put people in the position of a second year teacher and, and to actually feel her learning process as she's going through that learning process. So let's see if I have this thing on. Yeah. So what I'd like to do is weave together various strands of my work and uh, to, to present what I think is a portrait of various paths that people can take to learn to become culturally competent teachers. And I want to start, um, woven within this are going to be three short readings from my novel, White Bread, which just came out um, about uh, three weeks or so ago. And you're only the second audience to get a little bit of a reading. So you're going to get some pieces interspersed with other kinds of things. So to, to frame, um, I guess, the, the challenge that a lot of teachers face, this is from the beginning. Jessica's stomach sank as she anticipated her second year teaching fifth graders who seemed to come from Pluto while she hailed from Mercury. She scanned 33 new faces, about half Mexican, the rest white, most poor. Would she reach them any better this year? What did Michelle enjoy most about camping with her family? She asked about the story they had just read. Only the third day, she was still attaching names to faces. She glanced at a card taped in front of a bronze-skinned boy whose short black hair reminded her of a shoe brush. Jerome? Jerome whirled around and whispered, don't do that, to the boy behind him who stifled a giggle. Then to Jessica, getting chased by ghosts? Ooh, ghosts of Sherwood. Alvaro sitting behind Jerome, pantomime, drawing back a bow. They told ghost stories at night. They weren't chased by ghosts. Diana, what did Michelle enjoy most about camping? Jessica repeated, mentally marking these two boys to keep an eye on. That isn't how you say her name, Mrs. Westerfield, offered Mark, blonde hair falling across his eyes. Puzzled, Jessica looked at the name card again. Sweetheart, how do you say your name? At home, it's Diana, but my teachers always say Diana. She studied the page, apparently searching for the answer. Here it is. The thing Michelle enjoyed most was the river's big swimming hole. Thank you, Diana. Jessica made a point to use Spanish pronunciation. How many of you have been to a swimming hole? Three hands shot up. Matt? Before Matt could open his mouth, Alvaro blurted out, we go swimming at Lake San Antonio, teacher. Jessica's mental image of the story suddenly evaporated. Gone were the snow-capped peaks, pine forests, and waterfalls from her camping trip the weekend before. In their place, picnic tables rose from gravel alongside a large California reservoir rimmed by dusty brown hills and trees too sparse to offer shade. I asked Matt, but she barely heard Matt's reply as she affixed a stern look to her face just as a book crashing to the floor snatched students' scant attention from the camping story. So Jessica has um, kind of a lot to learn. She's 
focused right now on what the students don't know. She gets fixated on their behavior. And she's also worried about herself and who she is in this environment. And she describes herself culturally as simply white bread. And what's all this culture stuff about anyway? I just want to learn how to teach. So I'm going to um, spend a little bit of time with each of these four ways that are not mutually exclusive. I think they all work together really well. Four ways in which teachers can grow in becoming culturally competent. And I want to share with you examples with each of them. So let me start with, um, let me start with the first one, which is learning some curriculum and pedagogy strategies. I, um, for a number of years, taught a class multicultural curriculum design. And most recently, I'm retired now, but I still do a lot of work that I was doing before I was retired. Um, and was, yeah, and was um, teaching a class this summer in, at the University of Colorado, Boulder, um, that focused on multicultural curriculum design. And, and this book, it, uh, it, it, it's built around a framework that I use with teachers to help teachers learn curriculum and pedagogy to use in the classroom from a multicultural perspective. And it basically starts by having teachers study their curriculum, identify a core idea that's central to their subject matter that they could be teaching. And then we work on developing that idea in relationship to um, the knowledge that students bring from home, um, what James Banks calls transformative intellectual knowledge, which would be knowledge from ethnic studies, women's studies, critical cultural studies, and so forth. And there are other pieces to the, the, the framework. Um, and you'll see some of them with the example here. Um, but so I would like to illustrate a teacher working her way through this learning process. This is Angela, who, when I met her, was a second year teacher, very much like Jessica, in my multicultural curriculum design class. Um, the school that she was teaching in was a school um, in which pretty much all of the students came from so low socioeconomic background. And uh, the racial ethnic population, there was no racial ethnic majority. It was a very diverse student population. When I asked the teachers to reflect on what they were grappling with in their classrooms, one of the things that Angela wrote about was how to get students, let's see, let me move this so I can see this just a little bit better. And, and with like um, 60s eyes, they don't focus you know, as well as they used to when I was in my 40s, so. Um, one of the things that Angela wrote about was how to get students' behavior, how to manage behavior when things started getting chaotic. And she wrote this in, in a reflection activity that she wanted to be able to use uh, group activities in her class. But when she tried using them in the school, nobody else was doing group activities with students. And so the students would start throwing things and running around the classroom. And so she, she couldn't figure out how to how to do that kind of teaching. Um, she also ended up taking on the challenge of trying to figure out how to teach perspectives of indigenous people when the curriculum is not from that perspective. And this second challenge came about when I asked the teachers to identify a core idea that they would be teaching in their curriculum, say like two months from now. And so she looked in her textbook and said, well, um, I'm going to be teaching about the 13 colonies. So um, I could have the idea be about the process of colonization. And so that, that was what she picked. And the, in my class then, <laughs> the students need to develop that idea, um, not just from the textbook perspective, but also from the perspective of a historically marginalized group that the idea might pertain to. And they have to go do some reading, because most of them, they don't bring the content knowledge to be able to do that very well. So she decided to develop the idea of colonization from a perspective of Native Americans. And I remember the, her coming up to me after class and saying, um, what, what did Native Americans, like, how was the experience of colonization for them? And I just about dropped my teeth because here she was 
a well-educated person working on a master's degree and had never studied the history of North America from the perspectives of the indigenous people who were here first. And so I worked with her on things that, that, that she could read to get her, her going. Now, see, the next slide here is, now I've analyzed the textbooks of California as to how they represent indigenous people. And essentially up here, this summarizes what's in the textbooks. The fourth grade where you study the history of California mentions indigenous people at the beginning and then sort of not so much as the chapter goes along. In fifth grade, when students are studying about the US, there's a unit on pre-Columbian Native Americans on the East Coast, and then the storyline picks up with white people moving from the East Coast to the West Coast. And people of color then sort of added on here and there, but indigenous people basically drop out of the story. Uh, eighth grade students get US history again, and indigenous people basically disappear. And it becomes really a narrative of disappearance. When Angela analyzed her own textbook, she discovered that this was indeed the case. This is an excerpt from a paper that she wrote, but it was basically her coming to realize that indigenous people really weren't present in her textbook. So she had to do some reading. Um, these are some of the books that she read. I steered her toward things. She also read some articles, but I told her that um, in designing a lesson, she was going to need to not try to cover 500 years all of North America, because that would be way too big, but to narrow down, zero in on a specific time and a specific place, and really study in some depth the people who were there. So after she got kind of the big picture, that's what she did. And as she read, she realized that indigenous people were writing really a very different story about North America and experiences in North America. Um, people were writing about the well-developed, sophisticated cultures that were already here from which the Europeans learned quite a bit. Um, she was reading a story of massive genocide and dispossession. And she was also reading a story about contemporary Native American people and what the issues are that people are, are grappling with today. Um, being semi-sovereign people in a nation which many of the people don't even recognize your existence. Rebuilding economies um, when a lot of the, the historic economy and knowledge has been wiped out. And so as, as she was reading and trying to put all of this together, she came into my office one day before class and said, um, I am so confused, I don't know what I'm gonna do. I'm reading and all of these ideas are spinning off of each other, but it's like two opposite stories. There's the one in the textbook and there's the Native American story. And I'm not sure how I'm gonna put this together into a unit that's manageable for the little bit of time that I have. And um, I let her kind of sit with the idea because I wanted her to think through how she might grapple with this. One of her teacher colleagues, as she was talking to um, her colleagues, suggested, um, why don't you use the structure of a trial? So that's what Angela did. She decided to structure a trial in which the Haudenosaunee um, and the Wampanoag and Pequot would bring to trial the European colonists for their misuse of the resources. She, as she looked over her schedule, she could identify three class periods for this unit. Each of the class periods only 45 minutes long, because otherwise she had this really crowded curriculum, you know, that she was trying to to deal with. So these were what she did on each of the three days. And I visited her class the second and third day. The first day, she was giving the students background information about how a trial works, um, it, uh, about who the Wampanoag was. The, the Haudenosaunee were the, uh, the uh, sixth nation of the Iroquois and had developed a law, the, the Haudenosaunee law of peace and good mind, which sets up a structure for a trial. Um, and the process is somewhat different from the process from the English because with the Haudenosaunee are trying to figure out how to take a conflict and put people back in balance 
And the European, the, the English trial system, tries to figure out who's guilty for purposes of meeting out punishment. So the end goal is different. But bo both used a trial system. So she was giving students background information about this stuff the first day. The second day, she decided to connect this unit with an ecology unit in biology and had a um, simulation in the gym of hunters hunting the deer, first over hunting, or, or yeah, over hunting the deer and not over hunting the deer. And the kids were running around in the simulation and, you know, fifth graders in the gym and everything got sort of like energy levels going up. And so she rounded the students back up and took them back into the classroom. And I was visiting that day because I was real excited about this unit and wanted to see how it played out. So we got back in the classroom. And I, I could start seeing the pedagogical problems that she had been having. So she sat the students down and started asking them things like, OK, what were the three things we learned about ecology? Um, Jerry, what, what was one thing? And then she, and shh, everybody. And, and this, this kind of teaching that was uh, very control oriented and very, the students started then shooting spit wads, hitting each other talking, giggling, and as their misbehavior went up, her control-oriented teaching tried to clamp down on them. And I was sitting there going, oh, goodness, this is not exactly an example of good teaching. Because she knew I was doing this book where I have examples of teachers. And um, so I had to go to a dental appointment. So as I was driving to the dental appointment, I was like, how am I going to talk to Angela about this? Well, we'll go back the next day and we'll see what happens. So on the third day, she had developed a role play of the trial itself. The role play, um, it was the Wampanoag versus the colonists using the Haudenosaunee law as the, the legal basis. Um, the students all had roles. There were witnesses for the Wampanoag and witnesses for the colonists. There were judges. There were the jury. And each student, she had made little roll cards. So each student had a roll card. And it had information, a name, and information about what the person did. And she'd done a lot of research putting this together. She told me later that she spent extra time trying to make sure she was getting the names so that they were culturally accurate in addition to the information. Um, and so, and then she kept the thing moving. So it would be like, you know, the, the witnesses would testify and then we'd move on to the, uh, the jury would go out and, and while the jury was out, the students were writing reflection questions about what they thought would be the fair and just thing to do in this situation. And the misbehavior that I'd seen the day before, there was none of that. The students were really engaged in thinking and, and you know, kind of try, trying to be in their role and trying to think of what they would do. And a parent happened to come visit and was, he left saying, oh, I wish I'd brought my tape recorder. This is such a good class. And so afterwards, I asked her, um, Angela, what, what, yesterday was sort of rowdy, and today wasn't. What were the differences? And first she was like, oh, maybe the weather. And I tried to get her to think in terms of what she was doing, because on the third day, pedagogically, she was doing some things that were very good. Um, and, and this kind of summarizes some things that, that, that we debriefed with, that what she had learned. That when you have boring, control-oriented teaching that's aimed at a low academic level, the kids get bored and they start acting out. Out. And the more they act out, if, the more you dumb down your teaching, which is what she was doing, then the more they're going to act out, and you get this downward spiral. On the flip side of when you have something that's well planned, that's, that's well organized, that engages the students actively, um, and, and, and has the students thinking, the students really do get into the thinking part of the lesson, which is what the students had done. She also learned that in order to develop a good multicultural lesson well with the content, she had to go do some reading because she didn't have the background knowledge herself. Um, now, I left this um, really excited about the pedagogy that she had learned, but I also left knowing that there was a whole lot more that she needed to learn because she was in an environment in which there, the kids were viewed through a, a real deficit lens um, in which teachers did tend to focus on what the kids didn't know and then uh, fixate on their classroom behavior. And I was afraid that the same thing would happen to Angela if she didn't have some additional learning strategies in addition to what she had learned with curriculum and pedagogy. 
So this takes me to the next path of teacher learning that I think is incredibly important. And that's learning how to learn with and within and from the community where you're teaching. And this is particularly true for teachers who are teaching in settings that are culturally different from their own. When I think back to my own story, for example, coming from a, a, a white small town in southern Oregon, learning to become an urban teacher, which was definitely a process, not an event, something that, that took quite a bit of time. But key for me was time I spent living in a, a, a racially diverse, black, white, um, working class community and getting to know um, uh, other educators as well as some of my neighbors and getting uh, perspectives about how the U.S. works, how my school operated that were different from the perspectives that I had grown up with. And that incredibly changed me as a teacher. Um, there have been, there's been a lot of writing about the funds of knowledge in diverse communities. Um, these are a couple of quotations from Luis Mall and Norma Gonzalez. I won't read them. You can read them yourselves. But they've done work with, with um, looking at the knowledge that households have. Um, their work has been particularly with Mexican-American families in low-income communities. And in, when Luis Mall went into Mexican households, this was one of his a sort of categorization of the funds of knowledge in Mexican households, where then he tried to connect it back to academic disciplines. So you can see economics knowledge and medical knowledge and agricultural knowledge, and mechanical scientific knowledge, and religious knowledge that, that people have that the families didn't necessarily think of as academic, and that the kids didn't think of as academic, but that the kids were learning every day. And so the question became for him, how can we help teachers learn to tap into the funds of knowledge that students are learning at home and in their communities? Um, there's, there are a lot of reasons why teachers getting out into the communities they teach is, is really important, getting to know who the significant people are in kids' lives and developing relationships with people um, is, is just it's super incredibly important. There's also the, the fact that we develop um, a lot of our identity in the community. And there's a good deal of research um, that documents that students of color, uh, ethnic identity is important to everybody, but particularly students of color who have a strong, grounded ethnic identity tend to be better achievers in school than students who are trying to still figure out who they are. And as teachers get into the community and get to know the community where kids are forging their own identities, teachers can learn to understand better um, um, who the kids are and who they are becoming. So to illustrate this kind of teaching in action, we have Kathy. Um, Kathy was, um, she retired a couple of years ago, but she was teaching in a, um, a predominantly Mexican-American school in Salinas. She's a first grade teacher, uh, a bilingual teacher. She was actually born in Mexico. Her, her parents are Quaker, and then moved to Ohio where she grew up on, on a farm. Um, she then went back to Mexico and spent um, a, a couple of years there as a young adult, relearning Spanish and becoming fluent in Spanish and learning um, uh, quite a bit of the, the culture of the area of Mexico where she was living. And so she brought this background with her to, as a classroom teacher. When I had her in my class, she w talked about her interest in developing um, a, a unit around the concept of agriculture, because where the, the salad that everybody eats, a lot of it comes from the Salinas Valley. And the, the parents of Kathy's students were many of the farm workers who were out picking the salad that we eat for dinner. And Kathy was talking to me about the fact that the kids don't know a whole lot about what their parents do. But there were also issues around farming that she wanted the students to think about. In this quotation where I was interviewing her, she talked about having grown up on a farm in Ohio and having watched her family lose the farm when they couldn't afford it anymore. And 
and looking around, um, certainly in California, you don't see very many small family-owned farms anymore. You see these huge farms that are owned by um, corporations in Texas and other places. So the whole idea of a family being able to afford a farm is she, she wanted students to think about that. And this, uh, farms becoming owned by agribusiness is increasingly happening in Mexico as well, which is why a lot of, of uh, farmers or former farmers are coming to the United States looking for work. Um, she um, also here is talking about the fact that agriculture affects the lives of her students and that she wasn't teaching about agriculture with the idea that her students would become farm workers because their families did want them to go on and get a good education and not do the same kind of hard work that they were doing. But it, it would be a way of, of learning more about the context of their lives. Um, I asked her at one point um, if she thought, because you'll see that she taught some about politics in the unit, and I asked her at one point if she thought that first graders were too young for political issues. And here she was, this is just another quotation, where she's, oh, of course not. Um, kids hear about political issues all the time. They hear them from um, people talking, you know, the parents talking at home. They hear about them on TV. They hear things that are going on in the community. And so she said, I want kids to be able to bring their political questions into class so that we can talk about them. Class shouldn't be a place that, that dumbs down things for kids but should be a place where kids can raise real questions. So this is a diagram of her interdisciplinary unit on Monterey County agriculture. And by the way, Kathy had to follow the standards. Um, she had, I'll, I'll lay out the unit, but she had annotated the first grade standards that she was hitting on this uh, Xerox uh, uh, copy of the standard she had with little, I should have taken a picture of this, with little handwritten notes about how the standards mapped against her unit. So if anybody came in and wanted to know what she was doing, she could, this is the standard we're on. So she started off, uh, the social studies part of the unit was framed around the, the, the history and the work of the United Farm Workers. This is the uh, flag for the United Farm Workers. Um, and this part of the unit, she co-planned and did some co-teaching with parents. Um, every year it might be a, a different parent, um, and different parents had different expertise. But some of the parents were active in the Farm Workers Union, and she wanted them to come and talk about the union from their perspective. Um, she also sometimes had a parent come in and talk about small farming in Mexico versus agribusiness in the U.S. US, so she would do a compare and contrast of, of what the, that types of farms were like. Um, language arts, farming and local history vocabulary, um, fiction, nonfiction, writing across the curriculum. Okay, that one's kind of, you know, sort of obvious. Um, music, labor organizing songs. And I, I thought this one was, you know, somebody comes in and why are the students singing blah, 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 and she can point to the standard and say, this is the standard we're working on. Um, for science, the students were planting um, uh, planting seeds and then you know measuring seed growth, and then for mathematics, um, graphing and the concept of more than less than. And I was particularly intrigued with what she was doing with mathematics because often people will say that you can't do anything related to culture with mathematics because math is math, numbers are numbers. That's you know, and so I I came and watched. Um, Kathy, as, as she was doing the math part of the lesson and ended up um, helping her out with part of it one day. Um, she, when I walked into the classroom, she explained to me that the concept of, are any of you first grade teachers? Okay, the concept of, you can probably relate to this better than I can because I taught high school, but the concept of more than, less than. It's a key concept in mathematics and it's a hard one for little kids to get initially. And so that's what she really wanted to work on, and through graphing, because students were supposed to be able to create graphs and read graphs. So I walked into the classroom, and across the front of the room, she had something that looked sort of like this, a line across the board, and then the names of crops written in Spanish underneath. Um, should I translate? Uh, celery, flowers, uh, lettuce, artichokes, strawberries, broccoli, working at home, and other work. 
and she gave the students um, five by seven cards and had the students write uh, their name, where their parents worked on the card, and then had the students come up and put the cards where they go, creating a bar graph. Then she worked with the students on doing mathematical reasoning using their bar graph. So first the class as a whole, and then working in pairs, they would do things like, um, are more parents working in strawberries or in broccoli? Um, how many more parents are doing other jobs as opposed to uh, working with flowers, et cetera, et cetera? So the students were having to do mathematical reasoning, but not based on the bar graphs that were in the textbooks, but a bar graph that was relevant to their own lives. And it was really fun watching them because they, they really got into it. Later I asked Kathy, um, how's this impacting on their achievement? She, they're, they're getting it, so that's, that's what counts. And this is an actual picture of an actual kid with the actual graph. There were other graphs that she did, one of which involved gluing things onto pieces of paper, and I ended up helping her glue because otherwise glue was getting like all over the room. But, um, so, so back to Jessica. Back to Jessica. Um, Jessica, about halfway through the novel, decides to start doing home visits. Nobody's making her do them. But as she realizes that she doesn't really know where the Mexican-American kids come from, she met a lot of the parents at open house, but she really doesn't, she, she realizes that she just doesn't understand where people are coming from. So she decides to do home visits, and she asks for volunteers from her students as to who would be like me to come and just get to know your your folks at home. And to her surprise, the first person who volunteers is Alvaro. He was the one who was doing the, the you know, bow and arrow in, in the um, opening. So she, the, the scene takes place as she's driving up to the house. And I'll read an excerpt that near the end of the scene. Um, Alvaro's mother, her name is uh, Beatriz Perez. And Beatriz Perez doesn't, her English isn't all that great, and Jessica doesn't speak Spanish. So both women are trying to figure out how this is going to go. And Beatriz decides to invite one of the other mothers over who's fluent, who's from Mexico, but is fluent in English. Um, and her name is Maria Paz. So they're sitting on a couch, and um, Jessica is asked about their families, and the, um, Beatriz has gotten a, a photo album, and they're just kind of sitting there talking a little bit about where they came from in Mexico. And the, the two uh, mothers start speaking to each other in Spanish because they didn't really know where they came from. You know, they, they knew themselves here, but they didn't know themselves in Mexico, know each other in Mexico. And so, so now we have a conversation going. Uh, Maria Paz explained, a lot of Mexican farms used to sell fair crops at a fair price that farmers could live on. Now with all this cheap American produce coming in, it's much more difficult. Her family depended on the farm. Mine didn't. You see, my family has a large ranch. One of my brothers runs it now that my parents are older. My brother works as a financial advisor for a large company, but too much American produce creates problems for the farmers. Why didn't she know that, Jessica wondered, suddenly feeling ignorant. So much was missing from her own education and from a lot of news, at least the news she was used to paying attention to. Beatrice began turning pages in the photo album, naming people as she went. My uncle and his family, she pointed to a large family on a patio surrounded by vegetation. My cousins Gloria and Sandra with their children standing in front of a large old church. With page after page, a very large extended family came into view against backdrops of living rooms, patios, distant mountains, and flower bushes. How many of these family members does Alvaro know? Jessica finally asked. All of them. He forgets some names, but he sees all of them when we go visit, replied Beatriz. Might Alvaro or your other children go back and live there someday, she asked both women. Beatriz shrugged. They were born here. They're citizens. Maria Paz added, it will depend on where they get the best opportunities. We want our children to feel comfortable in both worlds, the one here in the U.S., and the one back home where mo much of their family still lives. We want to keep as many options open for them as possible. If they get university degrees, they'll be in the best position to decide where to live. 
Beatriz added emphatically. We want them to have a good education. We don't want them to have to do hard work like my husband and I, you know, cleaning and yard work, but maybe become teachers like you. Jessica tried to picture a grown-up Alvaro as a teacher. But to her surprise, she realized that she could conjure an image in which he was a lot like Esteban, who's a Mexican-American teacher in the classroom next door to hers. Um, uh, the hint of a smile crept across her face. This has been a wonderful visit, Senora Perez and Senora uh, Maria Paz. You've given me so much to think about. It is nothing, Mrs. Westerfield. We're honored you chose to visit our home, replied Mayor Beatriz Perez modestly, as though Jessica were the president. Please come again. A third path is learning through dialogue with students. Um, and for me, this has also been one that's been incredibly important. As I've visited several classes, as when I've been here, I've told stories about my learning to teach. And a lot of them were rooted in me learning to co-construct what I did in the classroom with, with my students. But there's always the question that teachers need to think hard about, of who have we learned to tune out? Who do we not see? Who do we not hear? Or who, when the students try to speak to us, do we think, oh, they're just complaining? Or they don't know what they're talking about, and, and so we don't really hear them. Um, for, for students who are um, members of historically marginalized communities, students of color, students from poverty backgrounds, students with disabilities, very often the teachers don't develop very good relationships with them and don't really learn how to learn from them and with them. So what if we learned to dialogue with the students who we've most learned to tune out? And what if we learned then to plan some of what we're doing in our classroom with those very students? Now that is the exact, oh, the exact issue that, wait a minute, let me go back here, that was taken up by this program in New Zealand. Uh, the name of the program is Te Kotaitanga. And it's a program that I had um, an opportunity to work with in several capacities over a period of several years, both as a consultant as well as later as a, as a researcher. Um, in, uh, these are the, it, it's actually a program that doesn't exist anymore in its, it's the form that it had in the wisdom of the Ministry of Education that got folded into another program, but there you go with what educational policy makers sometimes do. Um, but um, the, the, the co-directors of the program are Russell Bishop and Miri Berryman. And if any of you are interested, there's been quite a bit that's been published about the program. Um, most recently, yeah, for any of you like research types, an American Educational Research Journal, this last January, they published an article about the centrality of relationships to teaching. And what they were taking on was the question of how to improve education of indigenous students, which in New Zealand are the Maori students. Um, the Maori students in New Zealand, the, the, the issues that they face are very similar to the issues that students of color face in the United States. Um, the, just some statistical things, about 90% of Maori students are in English medium schools. There are some really good um, Maori medium schools in New Zealand, but that's not where most of the Maori students are. And Maori students face the same kinds of stereotyping, um, um, uh, not real good relationships with teachers, um, uh, uh, just uh, sort of the, the whole gamut of things that um, African-American and Mexican-American students faced in the United States. And grade 10 seems to be a critical year because that's when a whole lot of Maori students just simply leave. So they wanted to figure out how to get a handle on what the problem was and then to develop an intervention that would, would try to turn this around. So they um, worked with a couple of schools and did interviews with students, families, um, and administrators, and teachers asking the question of why are Maori students struggling in school? Now, if you look at the diagram here, um, there are are explanations that focus on the child and the child's family. So this would be people saying things like, uh, the kids don't care, the kids don't try, the families don't care about education, the, the families are, you know, the dad's in jail, and that kind of thing. 
things about structure have to do with the power imbalances in the wider society as well as in schools between Maori and New Zealand uh, Europeans. Things about relationships have to do largely with the quality of relationships between teachers and students in the classroom. Now, look at who's saying what. Just study that for a minute. And what jumps out at you? Yeah, yeah. The teachers are talking about what's wrong with the child and their family. Now, this is New Zealand. We wouldn't do this in the US. About what's wrong with the child and their family. And the kids are mostly talking about how the relationships with their teachers just isn't what is supportive of them. So the research team asked the Maori students, what would you like to see? And their responses basically brought out, out into these four areas. Um, oh, and they would say, this is quotations from, from some of the kids. You know, they, they, they think we're dumb. They don't try to get to know us. They blame us for things that we didn't do. And then the white New Zealander kids can get away with things. Um, they had, um, I know African-American students get issues with hats in the US. And Maori students have the blue, um, green stone. And we'll get issues with the green stone, wearing the green stone. And it's, it's, it's the same, you know, you read it and you could just substitute one word for the other and it ends up reading like the same thing. So they asked the students, what would you like to see? And the students said um, these kinds of things. They would like to have good relationships with their teachers. They would like the teachers to get to know them and expect that they can learn and give them really challenging stuff and then help them when they're not learning instead of just kind of leaving them and assuming they can't do it. They would like the curriculum, they didn't use these words, but they would like the curriculum to be meaningful to them. Um, th some of the kids talked about the fact that, that um, this one kid was talking about how um, the teacher, he was saying the teacher, they'll bring in stuff about the Chinese and the Japanese, and then they try to bring in stuff about Maori, and they don't know what they're talking about, but we're the experts on Maori, but they never ask us. So th they would like to be able to see their culture reflected in the classroom and to be some of the ones who are helping to bring that culture in. They would like to be taught in sociocultural active kind of learning. Um, the, they uh, particularly liked cooperative learning. They liked project-based learning. Um, so this is what the students wanted to see. So the team developed a professional development process that um, included several features. Um, the main focus of the professional development was to try to help the teachers develop relationships with their Maori students and then learn how to learn through those relationships and then base their pedagogy on what they were learning through those relationships. Um, they worked with in-school facilitators who were teachers um, within the school who were then released they, the facilitators would then go through training, learning how to be facilitators, and then work with other teachers in the building. And the main process then of the professional development would it would start with a three-day retreat where they would go to um, the, uh, the Maori space in, in um, New Zealand called the Marae. And they would spend three days on the Marae, which is really physically Maori space, um, bring your sleeping bag, and the, the food was cooked by the local Maori community, and they would go through ceremonies welcoming them. And then in that space, they would read the narratives from the, that had been conducted by you know, the, the earlier study so they could hear what teachers and parents and were, were saying about the kids. And for many of the teachers, reading those narratives was, oh my god, is this what my teachers are saying about me? And is this what I'm saying about my kids? Um, and then they would start learning something about um, pedagogy from Maori perspective and what they might do in the classroom. Um, then over the year, the facilitators would go into the classroom about once a month, and they had a structured observation schedule. And on the observation schedule, it would look at things like um, the, the uh, facilitator would identify five Maori students and then look at how physically close or distant the teacher was from those students over the 45 minutes, um, how much the teacher and the students interacted. 
um, how engaged the students were with the work, the um, academic level of the work that the students were given, um, the, whether students were completing the work, evidence of Maori culture in the classroom, and, et cetera. Then after the observation, the, the teacher and facilitator would find a time when they could sit down together and then go over the, collaboratively, go over the data from the observation. And the, the, these debriefing sessions were also designed to be relationship-based. It wasn't one person coming in saying, oh, you did this good and you did that bad, but more let's make sense out of this, this data and let's see um, what you might like to work on for the next time I'm here. There were other parts to the professional development, but this was essentially the, the essence of it. Um, so I was part of a research team that went into 22 of the 33 schools that at the time were in, engaged in this project. And we um, observed in like over 300 classrooms and interviewed tons of teachers and, and lots of students. And I'm not going to give you um, too much of the data because we'd be here all night. But Essentially, the teachers loved the professional development because they said it was the first time somebody was actually sustaining with them, helping them to, um, to become better teachers and to identify issues that they were having that they hadn't seen before. Um, it's a, I had quote after quote of these kinds of real positive quotes about the program. Um, it did make a difference in how teachers taught. About two-thirds of the teachers improved their pedagogy in ways that we as, as observers could see in the direction of culturally responsive pedagogy. And from the student's point of view, this was great. The students were overwhelmingly enthusiastic about teachers who had participated in this project. And they could tell, they could describe the differences between teachers who had and teachers who hadn't. And the ones who had had learned to form relationships with them and then to construct what they were doing in the classroom based on those relationships and on what they were learning um, on the basis of those relationships. Um, we looked at data like um, student achievement data, um, student retention data, and the Maori students were not dropping out in droves the way they had been before, and their achievement scores were going up in several of the academic content areas. So the, the whole idea of relationships being central to culturally responsive teaching, I think, is, is, is absolutely fundamental. The fourth path that I'm going to move on to is self-knowledge. Um, uh, this is a quotation by Geneva Gay and Kipchoge Kirkland talking about the centrality of self-knowledge for teachers um, because teachers do have a lot of say about what happens in the classroom. And uh, the decisions that we make, a lot of it comes from our own understanding of ourselves in relationship to our students. Um, I, I think about the issue for Jessica is that in, in the novel, she's starting to learn some practices. She's starting to play with her curriculum. She's starting to getting to know the community and particularly through the home visits. She's developing more relationships with her students, but she's still not quite sure where she fits in in conversations about culture. She still sees culture as being about them and not about me, as being about particularly about students who are black and brown and not also including people who are white. And she doesn't place herself yet in that conversation. But the book, which, which also has, you know, it's got some romance and mystery in it. It's, it's not all just learning to teach, so you, know, you can read it on the beach. But <laughs> it begins with, um, it begins with um, a letter after this disaster in the classroom. She goes home and she finds a letter in an old box of stuff that, that was her mother's. Her parents have passed away. And she's going through this box that she hadn't gone through before. And she finds this old letter written by somebody, an old woman in the late 1920s, written to her sister in Iowa about what happened to the German language and the German churches. And she's like, what is this? Who, who is this? Is this something that's in family documents? So maybe it has to do with me. And so one of her friends at school the next day says, well, you can research this stuff. So she begins doing her own family history research. 
Um, and she had been describing herself as white bread. Well, that's where the title of the book comes from. But as she starts doing this family history research, she starts learning about um, uh, bilingual, bicultural German-American communities in the late 1800s and early 1900s. So this last short little excerpt I'm going to read is when she's um, doing some volunteer work at the Democratic headquarters. Um, she's, she's had kind of a real bad weekend. She and her husband are on, really on, it's, things are very rocky. And so another teacher says, you know, you got to get out of yourself. Come with me. We're going to go do some volunteer work. So she sits down at a table and they're putting labels on door hangers. And she starts talking to some of the other volunteers there. And the people who are in this scene, um, Vic, who's an African-American architect who Jessica had met a couple of uh, months previously at a party. Um, a friend of Vic's, Gerald, who's African-American, and two white women, Teresa and Barbara. They're older women who uh, Jessica hadn't ever met before, but they're there as volunteers. So how's the research coming, Vic asked Jessica. What kind of research are you doing, Teresa asked. I'm looking into the German side of my family tree. I've become intrigued by these people who lived in Illinois and Iowa around the 1880s. She turned back to Vic. The biggest thing I've learned so far is that the Germans created these, you know, close-knit communities centered around the church, whatever German denomination it may have been. Their communities were like big extended families. People intermarried, so I guess maybe they really were family. Anyway, people were connected to each other at a deep level, like they looked after each other. They enjoyed being together. Smiling, Vic commented as if to himself, they knew who they were in the world. Yeah, that's it. How on earth did you find this out? Asked Barbara. From reading old digitized newspapers and other articles in, on, on, about the German churches and German immigrants, Teresa mused, hmm. It's funny. I was born right after World War II and grew up hearing terrible things about Germany, like they were all savage Nazis. My father fought in the war, so he hated them. Well, ironically, for all you know, you could be part German. Germans are the largest ethnic ancestry in the US, Jessica said. Huh, could be, said Teresa. They were just ordinary people, Jessica continued. They weren't Nazis. They weren't even military people. I think some of them came over here to avoid the draft when the Prussians were taking over everyone. Hmm, German draft dodgers, who would have thought, Gerald said. Jessica continued, the thing is, I didn't grow up with many stories about my family. A few about my parents' generation, hardly any about my grandparents, and none before that. It was almost like they didn't exist, like we don't have a past. Teresa said, I didn't grow up with many stories either. I heard a few about how hard my parents had it when they were young, but they didn't seem to want to talk about the past. The attitude was, who wants to hear about the old people when their ways are out of date and everything's changed? Vic shook his head. Why is it that a lot of white folks don't grow up with stories in their family? Hell, I grew up with all kinds of stories. Aunt Hazel was the family historian. She made sure everybody, uh, she knew everything about everybody and made sure we all learned what she knew. Same for me, added Ger Gerald. Even though my folks split when I was young, my mother made sure we knew who we were and where we came from, where we fit into a larger picture. Jessica said, that's just it, Gerald. Without the stories, you don't learn where you fit. Instead, you see life as something you improvise as you go, more or less in a vacuum. I guess that's why these German ancestors are pulling me in. They're my past. They seem to know who they were. I must be part of them, and all that got lost along the way. Um, as she keeps learning, she learns about the violent xenophobia during World War I and, and also World War II, but during World War I that in her family really squashed the German language and culture and squashed memory that these communities had ever existed. So she was really going back trying to recreate a history that in many senses had been lost. Um, this is, uh, comes from, and actually the, the German story in there is, is my own family history, but it comes from work that I've been doing in critical family history. When I'm te helping teachers learn to know themselves, there are several dimensions that I work with, and usually not all at the same time in the same class, because I try to spend a lot of time going deeply into each one, and some can get to be too much for one class. 
but knowing yourself as a cultural being today and how all of us are culturally constructed in everything we do. We're not acultural beings. When you walk into the classroom, you bring cultural assumptions and cultural ways of being and cultural ways of doing things with you. And you simply need to learn to recognize that. Um, learning yourself as situated in with relations, situated within relations of power. Um, when we look at where people are situated within race, um, for white people that becomes grappling with realities of white privilege. Where people are situated with relations to class, is it in a privileged position, is it in a subordinate position, and how does that affect your assumptions, the assumptions that you make about the world and about people around you. Um, relations of gender, relations of disability, th those are, are very important um, axes of power to look at. And then yourself as a historically located being. Um, and the, the book, White Bread, really works mostly with that part of claiming self-knowledge. Um, the project that I've been working on on critical family history situates what would normally be somebody's genealogy within a larger context of, of looking at the larger relations of culture, um, social relations, and, and history so that you can see this broader context. Um, and for those of you who are interested in theoretical underpinnings, that then I work there with critical race theory, critical whiteness studies, critical theory, critical um, uh, critical feminist theory, but I'm not going to sort of go there tonight because that would become a different kind of talk. But, uh, um, but, but this becomes ways of having, trying to get white people to look critically at our own history and at the history of this country through a critical lens and to understand better how it was constructed and to really deconstruct the myth that, um, which for most of us is a myth, that our ancestors came up here with nothing, uh, nothing but the shirt on their backs and pulled themselves up by their bootstraps. I learned that growing up and it turned out that mm, not, not, not exactly how it was. So I'll leave you with a final um, realization that Jessica had partway through the book. Um, Esteban, who is the teacher next door, Mexican-American teacher, a handsome Mexican-American teacher at that, who, is, who <laughs> helps her with her pedagogy, says this to her one day. Let's see, get, so I can see it. Esteban had just given her something to worry about. As the children were leaving for the day, he had stopped in the classroom to ask her how his loaned Mexican-American children's literature books were working out. Great, all four of them are being read, three by Mexican-American kids. I thought the books would be above their reading level, but they seem to understand what they're reading. Uh-huh, he nodded. That happens to any of us when we're reading something of personal interest. I wonder if your class's overall reading level would improve if you had more books your Mexican-American students could relate to. And Jessica walked out feeling, oh my god, what I had assumed of what's now called the, the racial achievement gap as just sort of being normal, I've been contributing to making that happen. So in that realization, Jessica, and I think any teacher can learn to shift from being part of the problem reproducing inequities to an ally working for equity and social justice. So thank you.